Namaskaram. <clears throat> Today I'm going to be talking about the 18th paragraph of Nana. Um, what Bhagavan says in this 18th paragraph is a continuation of what he was talking about in the 17th paragraph. What he said in the 17th paragraph, which we spoke about last time, is that just as we there is no benefit in analyzing rubbish that is be, to be thrown away. Uh, likewise, there's no benefit in analyzing all the tattvas that are said to be the constituents of the phenomenal world. Um, and, and analyzing how many they are and what their constituent and what their gunas are, what their qualities are and all that, it is it's futile. In other words, we shouldn't be concerned about anything other than ourselves. We are not seeking to know about this world or about anything else. We are seeking to know who am I. And that's the only thing that is worth knowing. Um, and then he ended that, that was in the first sentence, he said that. And then in the second sentence, he said, um, it is necessary to consider the world uh, like a dream. Though he said here, like a dream, that is when when it said uh, to consider the world like a dream, that can be interpreted in two ways, in either of two ways. Either we can take it to mean, but this world is nothing but a dream. Uh, it's just it's exactly like a dream. Or it, some people would can may take it to mean that it's just similar to a dream in some respects. Um, in in a dvaita. Um, the, um, among the ancient texts, the text that has emphasized most strongly that there is no difference between waking and dream is, um, is Godapada's Mandukya Karaka. And then Godapada is unequivocal, but waking and dream, that there's no difference between these two states. But many uh, Advaitins, uh, uh, people who generally accept a dvaita, but are not able to accept that this world is just a dream, they will argue that the, that the waking state is like dream in some respects, but it's not like that in all respects, because they believe in what is called shrishti drishti bada. They believe the creation exists there, independent of our perception of it. So whether we see it or not, this world exists. Whereas what Bhagavan teaches us and what um, um, Godapad also teaches by implication is that this world is just a dream. Therefore, it does not exist independent of our perception of it. This is what is called uh, drishti shrishti vada. That is, there's, there's no creation independent of perception. Drishti means perception. Literally means seeing, but it implies perception of, through any of the five senses. And uh, Shristi means uh, creation or projection. So this, this world is nothing but, it, it doesn't exist independent of our perception of it. This Bhagavan made very clear, for example, in, um, in verse uh, six of Uludunapadu, Bhagavan says, um, uh, Uluhu Aim Pulangul Uru, Verandru. The world is a form of five sense impressions, not anything else. The five sense impressions are sights, sounds, tactile sensation, tastes, and smells. If you take away these, all these five, there's no such thing as a world. So the world is nothing but these kind, five kinds of sense impressions. So, uh, uh, in, 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 in other words, the world is nothing but uh, these five kinds of perceptual phenomena. And perceptual phenomena are mental phenomena. So ultimately, the world is nothing but it's, it's mental. It's, it's, um, it, it's, the mind has created this world within itself, just as it does in dream. So this is the view of Bhagavan. And this he makes very clear in this, um, in this 18th paragraph. What he says in the first sentence of this paragraph is uh, Jagram uh, uh, Degam Swapnam Chanikam Embadu Tabira Veru Bedam Ile. 
um, that means besides the saying that waking is long, is diga, long lasting, that means, and dream is kshanika, that's momentary or lasting only for a very short while, there is no difference, meaning there's no difference between them. Um, though Bhagavan uh, um, seems here to point out a difference between waking and dream, in verse 560 of Guru Vachukavai, he refers to this sentence and says, the answer that said that whereas dream momentarily appears and ceases, waking endures for a long time, was a reply given by acquiescing to the question asked. Um, <clears throat> and then the verse continues, a deceptive trick which has arisen because of the of the adhering of mana maya, of, um, of mind, which is maya. Uh, that implies that this seeming difference in duration is just a deceptive trick or illusion that has arisen because of, uh, uh, because of the adhering of, uh, of uh, mana maya. Um, maya means uh, power of self-delusion and mana is mind. Um, according to Bhagavan, maya is nothing but mind or ego. It's only in the view of ego, but all this exists. So ego is itself maya or mind itself is maya. Um, so according to Bhagavan, even this seeming difference that waking is long and dream is short even this is not actually a, a, a real difference because it's from the perspective of ego in the waking state, but waking seems to be long and dream seems to be short. But so long as we are dreaming, we seem to be awake. And since we seem to be awake, it, that state we are in seems to be long lasting. What makes our present state seem to be long lasting is our memories. We remember what happened yesterday and uh, uh, more vaguely we happen, remember what happened last month and what happened last year and what happened 10 years ago, 20 years ago and what happened when we were children. We have so many memories. These memories of the past are what give our present state the, the, the appearance of being long lasting. But in dream also we have memories. When in dream we can often remember our childhood, we remember the school we went to, we remember what we did after we left school, what jobs we had, uh, what university we went to. We remember, we, we remember by and large most of the events of our life that we remember in this waking state. We can also remember them in dream. So since we seem to be uh, uh, awake while dreaming, and since we have memories of our of the past, so long as we're dreaming, the dream state seems to be just as long lasting as this present state. Um, this is what uh, well, Bhagavan doesn't directly say that, but this is indirectly implied in the next sentence. What he says in the next sentence is Jagratil Nadaku Nadakum uh, Viviharangal Elam. Evlo unmeaha tondru kindranavo. To what extent all the vivaharas that happen in waking seem to be real? Avalavu unmeahave, sopna til nadkum vivaharangalum, akala til tondru kindrana. To that extent, even the vivaharas that happen in dream seem at that time to be real. Vivahara uh, means activities, affairs, transactions, whatever is happening in waking seems to be real. But while we are dreaming, whatever is happening in the dream seems to be just as real as everything that is happening now seems to us to be real. So there's, there's, there's no difference in the experience that is as i say while we are dreaming we seem to be awake we assume we're awake sometimes we may have a doubt oh am i dreaming but we can also have a doubt in this waking state whether we're dreaming or not so the fact that occasionally the thought occurs to us this is all like a dream doesn't is doesn't show that it's the state is any different because we also there are times when this waking state takes a, on a dreamlike quality if um, if some 
for example, if we've been if we experience bereavement and we are we are um, we are um, mourning the passing away of someone who is very close to us, the world sometimes takes on a dreamlike appearance. It, uh, none of it seems real. It, it somehow loses it because of our our being immersed in that grief. The, the world just takes on a dream like it, it appears to us like a dream, and you we wonder is is all this true? Is this actually happening? Um, and also in the waking state, sometimes, for example, when we're very tired and we are about to fall off to sleep, just like in dreams, sometimes uh, what we have so in not in all dreams, but in some dreams, everything seems to be un, very unstable. One moment we're in one place, the next moment we're in another place, we're talking to one person, and suddenly that person becomes some other person. This we experience sometime in dream. But in, in waking state, there are times, for example, when we're falling asleep, where it's not clear whether we're awake or we're asleep. Everything, the, the solidity, the, the waking state loses its solidity and it becomes something somehow... Uh, it all becomes seems to be unstable. That is because we are slowly losing our hold on our attachment to this body and slowly slipping into sleep. So there's a we, we, we're we're neither waking nor dream, but somewhere in between. So from these experiences, we can see that actually there is there is no substantive difference between waking and dream. Now waking seems to be something different to dream this seems to be so real but while we're dreaming it seems whatever we're experiencing seems to be equally real to whatever it seems to be just as real as whatever we are now experiencing that is why generally when we're uh when we are dreaming we assume that we are awake so according to bhagavan this waking state is actually just a dream there's absolutely no difference between waking and dream um, and then in the third sentence of this paragraph, he says, Sopana till manum vera rudehate edutu kol kiradu. In dream, the mind takes another body. That means the mind takes another body to be itself. Now we experience ourselves with this body. In dream, we experience a body. Look, it seems to be very much like this body. So that is, so long as we are dreaming, we assume the body we're then experiencing is our dream body, our waking body. But uh, if we have an accident in dream and uh, injure ourselves, when we wake up, we find that in our waking body, there's no such injury. Or sometimes if we've been injured in the waking state, we may, for example, have broken a limb in the waking state. But in dream, we've forgotten about that, so we are walking around as if we, um, as if no, we hadn't broken any limbs. So it, the waking body, or at least the gross body of the waking state and the gross body of the dream state, the physical body, it's, uh, are two different bodies. Um, and then in the final sentence of this paragraph, uh, he says, "Jagram, uh, uh, jagram swapnam irendalum." In both waking and dream, Ninevagulam, uh, Nama Rupangalam, Ekakalatil Nihir Kindrana. That means in both waking and dream, thoughts and names and forms occur at one in one time, that's simultaneously. Um, names and forms here uh, implies phenomena, but according to Bhagavan, and what, why do they appear simultaneously? Because the names and forms are nothing but thoughts, and thoughts are nothing but names and forms. So actually, they're one and the same. As Bhagavan says in the, um, in the fourth paragraph um, of Nana, he says, um, uh, uh, Nine Vukale Tabitu, Jagam endro porul anyamai ille. Except thoughts, uh, there's uh, uh, excluding thoughts. There is separately uh, no such. There, there's not separately any such thing as world. And then he goes on to say, tukatil ninevugal ille 
Jagamomile, in sleep, there are no thoughts, and there is also no world. Uh, 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 Jagra Swapnangalil, uh, Ninevugal, uh, Ninevugal Ulla, uh, Jagamum Undu. In waking and dream, there are thoughts, and consequently, there's also a world. So, according to Bhagavan, this, this uh, the world we experience is nothing other than thoughts. That's why he says in this, um, in the final sentence of this 16th, of this 18th paragraph, but in both waking and dream, thoughts and names and forms appear, sim uh, appear simultaneously. The implication is that names and forms are nothing but thoughts, and conversely, thoughts are nothing but names and forms. They're, they're, all, all are just mental phenomena. Well, when Bhagavan uses the term thought, he uses it in a much broader sense, broader and deeper sense from the sense in which we usually use the term. Generally, when people think about thoughts, they think about the words and images that go through their mind, the mental chatter and so on. But according to uh, the sense in which Bhagavan uses the term thoughts, all phenomena of thought, all mental, all, that, that is, he used the term thoughts in the sense of mental phenomena. And since all, men, all phenomena are mental phenomena, according to Bhagavan, all phenomena are just thoughts. So there's no, when Bhagavan talks about thoughts, he means anything other than what we actually are. What we actually are is just pure being, pure awareness, uh, such it. Everything other than that is a thought. So all phenomena, all objects are thoughts. Not only are, the, are objects thoughts, even the subject, the one who is aware of all objects, is a thought. That, that's why Bhagavan, the subject, the one who is aware of all this, is ego. And that, this is why Bhagavan often described ego as the thought called I. Um, because ego is itself a thought. However, though ego is a thought, it is a thought unlike all other thoughts, because all other thoughts are jada. That is, they have no awareness of their own. They, they are not aware of themselves and they're not aware of anything else. Whereas uh, the only thought that, that is endowed with awareness is ego, because as ego, we are aware of our own existence and we're also aware of the semi existence of other things. So ego. Uh, though Bhagavan referred to ego as the thought called I, it is a thought uh, quite unlike all other thoughts. Then why does he call it a thought? Because ego is, as he often said, ego is chit jada granti. It is, the, uh, it is the, the knot that is formed by the entanglement of chit and jada. Chit means awareness. Uh, and uh, jada means what is not aware. So uh, the e ego is, the, is the, the mixed awareness, conflated awareness, I am this body. In, the, in this conflated awareness, the, the, the I am portion, that is, a, that is uh, the real awareness. That is our fundamental awareness of our own existence. Uh, that is what we actually are. That is what is real. But now we don't experience ourselves just as I am. We experience ourselves as I am this body. And we are identifying ourselves as a person. And when Bhagavan uses the term body, he means all the five sheaths. Um, as he says in verse five of Udalganapdu, Udal Pancha Koza Uru, the body is a form composed of five sheaths. Therefore, all five are included in the term body. Um, so, uh, the, the, the body, that's all the five sheaths, are jada. Whereas the, the I am portion of ego is chit. So when these two are, are mixed and conflated together, that, that entanglement is uh, what is called chit jada granti, the knot between chit and jada. Of course, pure chit, pure awareness is unaffected by this, but uh, it's only in the view of ego but chit and jada seem to have become entangled in this way. But in the view of, of the pure awareness that we actually are, there is no such thing as jada. There is only that is nothing other than that actually exists. So because ego, though it has an element of reality in it, in that it has got that pure awareness I am, because it conflates that pure awareness 
with a body, which is an object and therefore just a thought, the, the, the resulting mixed awareness is a thought. Though it has, but, but unlike other thoughts, it's got that element of reality in it. It's got that. The element of reality is the, uh, the, uh, our existence and our awareness. So the, the existence and the awareness of ego are real, but because of a mixture of adjuncts, they are distorted. So we are not experiencing our existence or our awareness as they actually are. What we actually are is pure being. That is, pure being means being that is unmixed with anything else. And pure awareness means awareness that is aware of nothing other than itself. That is what we actually are. But now we seem to be mixed up with all these phenomena and we, we mistake ourselves to be this, uh, this body consisting of five sheaths. Um, so th that's what Bhagavan says in this, um, in this 18th paragraph. It's a relatively short paragraph consisting of just four sentences. But what Bhagavan says here is crucial because this is, he's, he's talking here about one of the fundamental principles of his teachings. Because when he says, but waking and, but waking and dream, there's no difference between waking and dream. What he, we, we need to think about this and understand the implication of this. If, if there's no difference between waking and dream, that means what we are now experiencing is just a dream. Dreams, we, we all know, but dreams do not exist independent of our perception of it. So the implication is that not, none of the phenomena that we experience in this state have any existence independent of our perception of them. They seem to exist so long as we perceive them. When we don't perceive them, they don't exist at all. This is something that many people have difficulty um, accepting this. But if we, are, if we really want to follow Bhagavan's path, then if we are willing to accept this, this will be a great aid to us in putting what he has taught us into practice. Because if we understand that all this is just a... Uh, a mental fabrication, but none of these things have any existence independent of our perception of them, we will naturally uh, lose interest in them. We, 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 won't, we, we, won't have, we won't be so enamored with this world and the things in this world as we generally tend to be. Um, when, when, so long as we are dreaming, the dream seems to be very real. So we have desire, for so many things in the dream, we have fear of other things and so on. But both the desire and fear go when we wake up because we recognize it was all just a, a mental projection. So we no longer desire whatever we desired in dream. We no longer fear whatever we feared in dream because we know, oh, it was all just a dream. It was just a mental fabrication. Um, so to, to help us to wean our mind of its interest in and concern about the external world and the rec being willing to accept that all this is just a dream, all this is just a mental fabrication is a great aid to us in this path. Um, so there, I, I've already referred to what Bhagavan said in um, the fourth paragraph because there, there are many other places in Nana and other parts of Bhagavan's teachings where he clearly um, implies what he says explicitly here, but there's no difference between waking and dream. Um, in the fourth paragraph, after, after those three sentences which I read, but uh, um, excluding thoughts, there's not separately any such thing as world. In sleep, there are no thoughts, and consequently, there's also no world. In waking and dream, there are thoughts, and consequently, there's also a world. So the world is nothing but thoughts. Um, then he goes on there to explain this in more detail. And in the next sentence, he uses a, um, an analogy, which is, it's a famous analogy because it's used in, um, in one of the Upanishads. I can't remember which one. Um, but it's generally interpreted slightly differently to the way Bhagavan interprets here, or it's generally uh, understood in a different way. That is what Bhagavan says in the next sentence is, just as a spider spins out thread from within itself and again draws it back into itself, 
so the mind makes the world appear from within itself and again dissolves it back into itself. The difference between what Bhagavan is saying here and how this analogy is usually understood, it is usually uh, understood that it is Brahman that has projected the world and withdrawn it back into itself. But in the view, but Brahman is not a dreamer. Brahman doesn't dream. In the view of Brahman, Brahman means what we actually are. In the view of Brahman, nothing other than Brahman actually exists. Um, so what is it that projects the world? It is only the mind. The mind projects and perceives the world. Where does it project it? It projects it only within itself, just like a dream. So long as we're dreaming, we seem to be a person within the dream. And because we seem to be a person within the dream, the dream world seems to be outside us. But as soon as we wake up, we recognize that that entire dream and everything that happened in it, and all the, the objects that were perceived in it, existed only within our own mind. It seemed to be outside of ourselves only because we had limited ourselves to the extent of a body in that dream. So though when we are dreaming, though we, it, who has created the dream world, it is only ourselves. We, we ourselves have projected that. But because we perceive ourselves as if we were part of our projection, we no longer seem to be the the creator of it. That is, when the, if the creator mistakes itself to be a creature, one of the, one of one of the, one of the, uh, creatures in its creation, it no longer feels I am a creator. It feels, oh, I'm a part of the creation. Likewise, when we are dreaming, because we take ourselves to be a person in the dream world, it seems like the dream world is out, it exists outside ourselves, and that we have no control over it. That is, uh, if we are being chased by a monster, for example, that monster is nothing but our own mental fabrication. But, but we are not able to just will that monster away. We can't just say, oh, I don't want this monster, to, I want this monster to disappear. It won't disappear. Why? Because we, we no longer experience ourselves as the creator of the dream, the one who is projective of the dream. We experience ourselves as a part of the projection. So we, we, as in the dream, we seem to be powerless. If we're being chased by a monster, we are desperate to find some place of safety where we can, where we can hide from that monster. But when we wake up, we realize the monster, the place that we tried to hide in, the person we took ourselves to be, all are just our own mental fabrication. They all existed only in our own mind. Um, so what is it that projects the world? Uh, and, and draws it back into itself, like the spider um, spins out the thread and draws it back into itself, it is only the mind, according to Bhagavan. Mind in this context means ego, because the, the, <clears throat> the term mind, um, it's often used as a collective uh, uh, term to refer to the totality of all thoughts. But of all the thoughts that appear in the mind, the first thought, the essential thought, is the first thought called I, in other words, ego. ego. So ego is the, is the essence of the mind. Why is it the essence of the mind? Because all other thoughts exist only in the view of ego. So other thoughts are all objects, whereas ego is the subject. So often when Bhagavan is talking about the mind, He's referring only to ego, to the perceiving element of the mind, that is the essential, uh, the first thought, the thought called I. Um, then after, uh, after giving that analogy, in, uh, this in the fourth paragraph of Nana, he says, Manam Apma Sarupa Tanindru uh, Veri Padam Podam Jagam Tondram. When the mind comes out from Atma Sarupa, the world appears. Atma Swarupa means uh, Swarupa means real nature. Atma means oneself. So Atma Swarupa is the real nature of oneself, what we actually are. So when the mind comes out from Atma Swarupa, the world appears. So the, uh, Atma Swarupa is Brahman. So it's not Atma Swarupa, it's not Brahman that is creating the world. When the mind comes out from Brahman, 
it creates, it projects the world, the way the world appears. And then he goes on to say, Ahayal jagam tondram podu sarupam tondradu. Therefore, when the world appears, sarupa, one's own real nature, does not appear. In other words, so long as we are seeing the world, we're not aware of ourselves as we actually are. Why is that? Because so long as we are seeing the world, we are, we are, we who see the world are only ego, and ego is that which always mistakes itself to be a body, one of the objects in its projection. Um, so, so long as we are perceiving the world, we are not aware of ourselves as we actually are. That's the implication of that sentence. And then in the next sentence, he says, Sarupam tondrum, and then within brackets, prakasikam podu, uh, um, jagam tondradu. That means when, the, when Swarupa appears or shines, in other words, when we know ourselves as we actually are, uh, the world does not appear. So it's only when we allow our mind to come out and to, to, to forsake our real identity, which is just I am I, and when we rise as ego, which is always aware of itself as I am this, I am that, I am this body, but the world appears. So when, when, when we are, when we, so long as we are perceiving any world, we are aware of ourselves as if we were something within that world, as if we were a person in that world, as if we were a body. So, and therefore, we are not aware of ourselves as we actually are. When we are aware of ourselves as we actually are, there will be, we, we, will, we will be aware of ourselves as a formless, infinite whole, in the clear view of which there is nothing other than ourselves, and therefore no world at all. Um, and um, in the, another connection with this 18th paragraph, we can find in the, in the um, fifth paragraph, um, in the last um, four sentences of the fifth paragraph, what Bhagavan says is, Manatil tondrum nine vugal elavitricum na nenum nineve mudal ninevu. Of all the thoughts that appear in the mind, the thought called I alone is the first thought. Uh, uh, mudal ninevu means first, mudal means first or primal or basic or original or causal. So, so the, the first thought, the thought that causes all other thoughts, the basic thought, is this thought called I. Um, and then he goes on to say, Idu arenda pirahe enia nine vugal erukindrana. Only after this arises do other thoughts rise. Why is this? Because this, this thought called I is, uh, in other words, ego, is the subject. All other thoughts are objects. Objects seem to exist only in the view of the subject. So without, without ego, no other thought can exist because all other th thoughts uh, seem to exist only in the view of ego. So if we are not perceiving thoughts, they, they, they can't exist independent of our perception of them. So, so no other thought can rise without ego. When, but, but as soon as ego rises, all other thoughts uh, come into existence. Um, and then he says in the next sentence, Idu arinda, arinda perahe, perahe, uh, enia nine vugal erukindrana. Only after this arises do other thoughts rise. So only after the subject appears can objects appear. The, the first thought I is the subject, all other thoughts are objects that seem to exist only in the view of the subject. So only after the subject has appeared can other thoughts appear, ob can objects appear. And then in the next sentence, he says the same thing using different terms. Tanme uh, tondre apirahe, only after the first person appears, munile padakeigal tondru kindrana, do second and third persons appear? Uh, the first person means ego, the first, the, this primal thought called I, and second and third person means all other things, all phenomena. So only after the, the, the subject, the perceiver of all phenomena appears, can all the phenomena appear. Without, without the first person, the, without ego, nothing else can appear. 
And then he concludes this paragraph by saying, Tanmay Indri Munile Padake Gal Ira. If um, uh, uh, without the first person, second and third persons do not exist. First person, as I say, means ego. Second and third persons means everything other than ego, all objects, all phenomena. So Bhagavan clearly says here, nothing else exists independent of ego. This is a fundamental principle of Bhagavan's teachings. For example, in, um, I mean, he's, he emphasizes this in so many ways, in so many different places. For example, in the final paragraph of Nana, in the first sentence of the final paragraph, of the first two sentences, he says, Tan uh, erundal sakalomum erum. If oneself appears, everything appears. Here oneself means uh, the ego or mind. So if, if ego or mind appears, everything else appears. Um, uh, tan adanginal sakalomum adangum. If oneself subsides, uh, the word that he uses for subsides also means disappears or ceases. So if oneself subsides or ceases, everything subsides or ceases. So all other things will cease to exist. When we don't, when, when we cease to rise as ego, everything else will cease to appear. Um, this is something that he also emphasized in so many ways in Uludu Napadu. For example, in, the, in, the, uh, 20, in verse 26 of Uludu Napadu, he says, uh, mm-hmm. If ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. A hande in drail in druanatum. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. A hande a yavamam. Ego itself is everything. That is, all other things seem to exist only in the view of ego. So they have no existence independent of ego. So what they essentially are is nothing but ego. Just like everything we see in a dream is nothing but our own mind. It, that is, we are seeing ourselves. At that dream world. Likewise, everything that we now perceive, we are seeing ourselves as all these things because nothing other than ourself actually exists. So, um, as I say, in, in that verse 26, he says, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. Ego itself is everything. So, in other words, everything is just an expansion of ego. And then he concludes that verse by saying, Adalal, Yadui do Andrew Nadale, Ovadal Yavamena or. That means, uh, therefore, know that investigating what this is, that means what this ego is, is giving up everything. Why is it giving up everything? Because as he explained in the previous verse of Ulugnapri and in so many other verses and places, the nature of ego is to rise, stand, and flourish by attending to things other than itself. If instead of attending to anything other than itself, if it turns its attention back to see who am I, it will subside and uh, dissolve back into its source because it's got no independent existence of its own. So we seem to be ego only so long as we're looking at other things. If we look at ourselves, we can't find any such thing as ego. Nobody has ever seen ego. Ego seems to exist only when we're not looking at it. When we're looking elsewhere, when we're looking at things other than ourselves, we seem to be ego. If we turn our attention back to see who am I, we find that there's actually no such thing as ego. There's only just pure awareness. That is what we actually are. Just like if you, if you see a rope and mistake it to be a snake, so long as you don't look at it carefully, it will continue to appear to be a snake. In order to see what it actually is, you need to look at it very closely. If you look at it closely enough, you'll see, oh, it's just a rope. Then you know there never was any snake there. Likewise, if we, if instead of attending to anything else, if we turn our attention back within to try to see who am I, this ego will subside and dissolve back into its source. This is what he says in verse 25 of Uludanapdu, Tedinal uh, Otum Pidicum. If sought, it takes flight. That is, if ego, if sought means if ego investigates itself, in other words, if it turns its attention back within to see who am I, 
it will take flight. That means it will subside and dissolve back into its source. So since everything else depends for its seeming existence upon the seeming existence of ourself as ego, when we investigate ourselves, ego will subside and dissolve back into its source, and everything else will subside and dissolve <laughs> along with it. Wondering. So since, since everything else seems to exist only in the view of ego, and since ego will subside and dissolve back into its source, if it investigates itself, by investigating ego, we not only will ego subside and uh, dissolve back into its source, everything else will subside and dissolve back in uh, along with it. That's why Bhagavan says, investigating what it is, is giving up everything. So this is, this is the, what, what Bhagavan talks about in this 18th paragraph about um, about the, 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 the fact that the weak, I mean, the implication of this 18th paragraph is that what we now take to be the waking state is actually just a dream. This is a fundamental principle of his teachings. So we need to, we need to think about this deeply and understand it clearly. One of the implications of this, which, which may seem difficult to uh, digest at first, but if we think about it deeply, it's very, it's very logical. If all this is just a dream, the, the, who is it who perceives the dream? So long as we are dreaming, we seem to be a person in our dream, and there seem to be so many other people. Because we mistake ourselves, the perceiver, to be a person, we take all the other people, we mistake all the other people to be perceivers. So, so long as we are dreaming, it seems to us that all the other people are perceiving the world just as we are. But as soon as we wake up from a dream, we recognize that those people were all our own mental fabrication. They didn't exist, at, they, they didn't exist at, except in our mind. So they weren't actually experiencing, perceiving anything. Um, so if something happened in a dream, if something very embarrassing happened in a dream, we may have been very embarrassed so long as we were dreaming. As soon as we wake up, our embarrassment goes because whatever, whatever we did that caused us embarrassment in front of so many people, we, because we know those people weren't, they, there was no one else seeing that dream except us. So we, whatever, whatever foolish or terrible thing we did in the dream, we can keep it to ourselves. We don't have to tell anyone else because it's all only in our own mind. So if our present state is just a dream, that means all that, that we, the only one who is perceiving all this is ourself, this ego. But we, we need, this is the implication, but we need to, we, we need to understand this in, very correctly. That is, so long as we are dreaming, we take ourselves to be a person, and so we take all the other people to be just like us, to be ego perceiving the world. So long as we are looking outwards, we seem to be a person, and consequently, all the other people seem to be just as real as us. So though this is all just a mental fabrication, it is not being perceived by anyone other than ourselves. Now we mistake ourselves to be a person. So it seems, it seems to me now, I, Michael, am perceiving this world. Actually, Michael isn't perceiving the world. Who is perceiving the world? It's the I that takes itself to be Michael. The I that is aware of itself as I am Michael. That is what is perceiving the world. But because I uh, I mistake myself to be Michael. It seems to me that Michael is perceiving the world. So if Michael is perceiving the world, all the other people are perceiving the world. So, so the, this teaching is a very deep and subtle teaching because this, this enables us to understand who is experiencing this world. It is not the person we seem to be who is experiencing the world. It is the ego, the one who mistakes itself to be this person who is perceiving the world. So, so long as I look outwards, I seem to be Michael. So Michael seems to me to be very real. And so I'm so concerned about Michael. I'm concerned about Michael's comforts and, um, and uh, all, but everything. That he, Michael should get his food every day, but he should have a nice, clean, dry place to sleep. And that there should be adequate 
food, clothing, shelter, all these basic necessities. I'm so concerned with, to provide all these things for Michael because I mistake myself to be Michael. So if I am Michael, then it's equally true that all the other people are, they, they are, they are, the other people are just as real as Michael. So if I am Michael, that I should be equally concerned about all the other people that I, as I am about Michael, because those other people are just as real as Michael. So, so long as we are looking outwards, we should behave in this world as if we are just one among many, because that's how it appears to us. And for, for all practical purposes, yes, we are just one among so many billions of creatures in this world, not only humans. I mean, there are, some seven billion, seven or eight billion people. I don't know how what what the latest figure is, but there are also so many other uh, beings, uh, bodies, but just like us, seem to be sentient. They see that, that is uh, all the uh, all the animals and insects. They seem to be just as sentient as we, as this person we take ourselves to be seems to be. So so long as we're looking outward, we should behave in this world in an appropriate manner. We should have. We should be kind and considerate and compassionate and so on. Because those other people we see are just as real as the person we, must, we take ourselves to be. But, so then why did Bhagavan teach us? But the truth is that we alone are perceiving all this. All this exists only in our view. This is to, to enable us to separate ourselves from this person. Yes, if I am Michael, I'm just one among seven billion. But am I Michael? So when we turn our attention back within, this is where this teaching, but there is only one perceiver, only one ego, who's one dreamer, is what is called Ekajiva Vada, the, the contention that there's only one Jiva. This is what Bhagavan taught us. But the, the reason this is taught is to turn our attention back in, within to investigate who am I, this one jiva? If we investigate this one jiva, this ego, we will find actually there's no ego at all. <laughs> what actually exists is only Atmosulta, that pure awareness I am, but is shining equally in all of us. So, so the reason Bhagavan taught us this Eka Jiva Vada, the fact that there's only one jiva, is to aid us in our effort to turn within. It is not to make us change. It's not to change how we behave in this world. We should, if, so long as we're looking outwards, we should behave in this world as if we are just one among so many. But uh, uh, we should un we, inwardly we should understand all this is only my own mental fabrication. Not only is all this world my own mental fabrication, even the person I take myself to be is my own mental fabrication. So I am not this person. Who am I? We turn our attention back within to try and investigate and find out what we actually are. When we know what we actually are, we, we will no longer rise as ego because ego is nothing but a false awareness of ourselves, an awareness of ourselves as I am this person, I am Michael or I am whoever. So that, that mixed awareness, I am Michael, that is ego. But, but what I but what I actually am is only that pure awareness I am. That is what we need to investigate. So we are turning our attention away from the world and away from the person we seem to be back towards that fundamental awareness I am. That fundamental awareness I am alone is what is real because it's what exists and shines in all the three states. Now we are aware I am. In, in dream, we're aware I am. Even in sleep, we're aware I am. The difference between sleep on the one hand and waking and dream on the other hand is in sleep, we are aware only I am. We're not aware of anything other than our own existence. Whereas in waking and dream, we are aware of ourselves as I am this person. And consequently, we're aware of so many other things. So this is the difference between waking and dream on the one hand and sleep on the other hand. So waking and dream are exact. Though we talk about them as waking and dream, there's actually only one state. It's all only a dream. But we talk about waking and dream because whatever be our current dream seems to be us to be waking. And all other dreams seem to be dreams. So there seems to be a difference. 
between waking and dream. But as Bhagavan explained in this paragraph, this is only a seeming difference. There is actually no substantive difference between waking and dream. Some people try, there are so many arguments that can be given against this view, but our present state is just a dream. People say, oh no, in dreams, things are very inconsistent. Sometimes you're in one place and suddenly you're in another place or you're talking to one person and suddenly it becomes another person. Everything is so, um, so inconsistent and unstable. Yes, that is true in some dreams, but not in all dreams. In some dreams seem very stable, seem, seem just as consistent as our present state seems to be. So why that difference? These are not substantive differences. They're only qualitative differences. In both the, the, the unstable dream and the stable dream, we are aware of ourselves as I am this body, and we are consequently aware of a world. Bhagavan explained the reason why some in some dreams the whole everything seems to be less stable, less consistent, is that in such dreams we are not so uh, strongly attached to that body. The more strongly we are attached to the body, the more stable and consistent our experience seems to be. But these differences are between one. I mean, some dreams are are. are they're, they're different qualities of dreams. They're qualitative differences, not substantive differences. It's like um, if if you watch a, a film made in the 1920s and a film made in the 2020s, there's a huge qualitative difference. That is, the, 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 the modern cameras are so much more sophisticated the whole technology is so much more sophisticated if you have um, if you have uh, animation has become, now become so realistic you can have films with dinosaurs and dragons and all sorts of mythical creatures you can have um, battles going on in outer space and everything how all these things now if they tried to do this a uh, hundred years ago they could do it it would be it would be very obvious that it was just a model dragon because they didn't have the sophisticated technology. So there's huge qualitative differences between films made in the 1920s and films made in the 2020s. The, 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 the technical uh, differences are, uh, make a huge difference in quality, but these are just qualitative differences. Whether you're watching a Charlie Chaplin film made in the 1920s or some film made in the 2020s, you're still watching a film. The, the quality of the production may be different, but the film is the same. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's still only a, a, a film. Likewise, be, between one dream and another dream, there, are, there may be qualitative differences, but the sub, there's no substantive difference. Whether it's a dream that is fleeting and unstable, or one that seems very realistic, uh, that seems very consistent, it, it's still only a dream. So, if we think about it, there is there's another way we can consider this. Is there anything in our present state, is there anything that we are experiencing in our present state, but we could not experience in a dream? No, obviously there's not, because we can experience anything in a dream because it's a dream. So since there's nothing that we are experiencing now, but we could not experience in a dream, we have absolutely no evidence that what we are experiencing now is anything but a dream. It's just, it's just the reason we, we make this distinction between waking and dream is so long as we are experiencing a dream, we experience ourselves as a person, as a body in that dream. So because we, what is real is only ourself. But when we mistake ourselves to be a body, that body seems to be uh, real because I am real. If, I, if this body is myself, then this body is real. So we superimpose our own reality upon the body that we currently take to be ourselves, And because this body is a small part of this vast universe, the, the whole universe uh, uh, appears to be real. 
That is, if this body is real, then the universe must be real. So we superimpose our own reality upon this body and consequently upon the whole world. So whatever world we are body and world we are currently experiencing seem to us to be real. But when we leave one dream and come to another dream, our identification with the body of the previous dream is severed. We no longer experience that dream body as I. As soon as our connection with that dream body, as soon as our identification with that dream body is severed, we at once recognize, oh, it was just a dream. So long as we were dreaming, it seemed so real. As soon as we separate, we are separated from that body, as soon as our identification switches from that body to some other body, the previous body and world, see, we are, uh, immediately we recognize, oh, it was just a dream. It was just a mental fabrication. It didn't exist. And we all know that dreams don't exist independent of our perception of them. So we... There is absolutely, if we think about this, this subject deeply, there is absolutely no reason for us to suppose that what we are now experiencing is anything other than a dream. And as, according to Bhagavan, it is only a dream. So if we think deeply about this and understand it clearly and correctly, this is a great aid for us for helping us to turn our mind within. Because so long as we take this world to be real, and all the seeming pleasures of this world and all the people in this world, so long as we take all this to be real, naturally our mind goes out towards it. But when we, when, if we are willing to accept that this is all just a dream, it's all just a mental fabrication, it has no existence independent of my perception of it, then we will lose interest in the, what is perceived and we'll try it, we'll, we'll become curious to know, then who am I the perceiver? And we turn our attention back to investigate ourselves. So whatever Bhagavan has taught us, is, has, he, whatever he taught was for practical purposes. So that is, all his teachings have practical implications. So when we think about his, things like this that he's taught us, we need to understand not only what he taught, but also why he taught it. What is the practical implication of this? How this, how accepting that this is all a dream, how will it help me in my practice of self-investigation and self-surrender? Naturally, it will help us because when we, if we are willing to accept that this is all a dream, we will become more detached from it. It'll be easier to, to free ourselves from identification with this person and with the uh, the world that this person seems to be a part of. So we'll, 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 we'll detach ourselves and it'll be easier for us to go within. And I mean, th this is all what the, the essence of all Bhagavan's teachings is that we should turn within to investigate who am I. That is what his teachings are all about. So all these other teachings are just to, to uh, motivate us and encourage us to turn within to find out what we actually are. If all this is just a dream, it, it seems to exist only in my view. So who am I who is seeing all this? We turn our attention back towards ourselves. This is the purpose of, of um, what Bhagavan has taught us. In, in, in Well, all, all of Bhagavan's teachings, if we understand them correctly, we will see the we will understand, but without understanding the practical implication of what Bhagavan has taught us, we haven't really understood it. And all Bhagavan's teachings, the, the practical implication all comes back to the need for us to investigate and know what we actually are. And only by investigating ourselves and knowing what we actually are can we surrender this ego. Because it, so long as we are looking outwards, Ego is being uh, fed and nourished. So in order to, to, if we want to give up ego, we need to let go of the external world and turn within. We need to let go of everything else and attend only to I. The more we attend to I, the more other things drop off and eventually we subside and merge and dissolve back into our source. This is what Bhagavan's teachings are all about. This is the whole purpose of everything that Bhagavan has taught us. Term within, know who am I. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Arana Chalaramanaya.